tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 21. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing three stories for you about mythical monstrosities, vampiric vengeance, and sinister spirits. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low. And settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes to us from author Michael Page. In it, we'll meet Jack, a gentleman down on his luck, doing his best to survive life on the streets. But just when things couldn't seem to get any worse for him, he hears the screaming and his life will never be the same. Without further ado, I present to you the Molindinar Burn. Jack McKay huddled in the cold midnight street with a pale green sleeping bag encasing his lower half. Spindled trails of light reflected off the gleaming roads from the damp lamp posts. Cold wasn't what gave Jack his nightly jitters, not by a long shot. The small flame bewitched his green eyes just below the bent spoon full of rose-gray powder. This last week of panhandling had been kind to him. It was likely shit called he riddled with impurities, but that was irrelevant. He had an itch, so why waste what the good Lord delivered? Might leave a wee aftertaste in your gob, but you'll enjoy the ride. Trust me. The dealer had assured him. As much as a dealer would. A little further down the pavement was another homeless man draped in a tan blanket. He was sitting upright with his face buried between his knees. Jack knew him as Graham Wilson, a neurotic character he had met in McHugh for the shelter off Crimea Street, before they reached capacity and shoot everyone else away. A man was approaching, dressed in some thick woven coat, and Rupert Bear trousers. His footsteps sounded strange against the asphalt. Uh, clop, 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 as if he were wearing a pair of tap shoes. A large black tweed hat covered his face, he bent down to Graham and mumbled incoherently to him. The two exchanged mumbles for a minute or so before Wilson nodded. 
the corner of his eye, Jack watched the two disappear into an alleyway. Probably going to suck him off for alcohol pounds, Jack thought to himself. Once the powder became a gooey black puddle, Jack dipped in the needle tip and drew up the ethereal fluid of the angels. His arm was permeated with collapsed blood vessels too narrow and bruised for use, but he still had a few good ports left. He spied a surviving vein among the scarred landscape and slid the needle in slowly. One pull of the plunger to check for blood, then a slow push forward until the black substance disappeared. First, his arm tingled as though someone lit a fuse in his venous expressway. Then all at once, an extracellular stimulant erupted into a euphoric surge. Pure illusory pleasure coated his brain like thick, warm wax. The jitters stopped. Glasgow, with its year-round Atlantic gales, with its Victorian tenements and modern skyscrapers, no longer existed. And for a moment, his thoughts reached the peak of the vast universe. Then the screaming started. It was a horrible shrill of horror. It came from around the corner and sounded like it was pouring straight out of Graham's throat. Through his veil of dazed elation, Jack couldn't drown it out. Someone needed help. His help. He lumbered over the walkway and rounded the corner before his drug-weighted thoughts could catch up. As he reached the narrow gap between two tenements, the ovulating stopped. Double yellow lines ran across the side street's edge, with a few bin wagons under the orange glow of a street lamp. There was no trace of the two men between the chipped brickwork. The pathway was a dead end of dilapidated windows, only one way in or out where Jack stood. Still not entirely at his wits, he stepped inside where Graham and his screams dissipated. An odor of wet trash and rusted iron perforated the air. A drain cover was lying next to a void in the asphalt. Jack peered down the exposed pipe. Assisted by the orange light, he could make out something lying at the bottom of a chute. A mangled human hand. Two fingers were missing. The palm was, for the most part, peeled away from the exposed tenons in a ghastly fold. Jack tumbled forward from the sight and nearly vomited the universe from his body. Without another thought, he barreled out of the area as fast as his legs allowed. To say the vile image of that disfigured hand smothered Jack's thoughts was an understatement. Every night after the incident, he tried fruitlessly to expel the repeating scenarios of Graham Wilson sitting on the same street corner like him, followed by the clop, 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 and the screaming. Why those sounds? Why wear those shoes? Maybe the dealer had snuck some hallucinogenic kick in his merchandise. It's difficult to trust your eyes with a mind as high as a kite during Hurricane Bagwag. Jack was too afraid to tell the authorities, let alone to check that dreadful place again. Russell Gresham one of the few souls left in his social circle who wasn't a peddler, was the only one he could tell. He had several years over Jack and had been sleeping rough in Glasgow far longer. His face was a contoured map of wrinkles with a scruffy walrus mustache beneath a jutting nose. In his earlier years, he'd been a gamekeeper for deer before the Parkinson's worsened and One bill after another went unpaid due to the alcoholism. The two squatters often slept and conversed in the rickety upper level of a condemned corner row house off Greendake Street. Any passerby would notice the mounds of accumulated garbage and the front door covered in violation notices. The corridors were dark and unheated, and uncovered bulbs protrude from the ceiling fixtures over bare wooden floors and uncurtained windows. 
I gotta tell you something about Glasgow. Russell told Jack, only it came out more like Glasgow. What you saw was a shame, a heavy shame. But when you've known these streets as long as I have, the dear green city starts to look a hell of a lot less green. Every town has its dark corners, but the devil be damned if we don't have some wicked ones. Jack's spine was firmly against the wallpaper that peeled off like dead skin. Russell and his ramblings could no longer reach him. There were nothing but white noise and incoherent whispers in the faraway glades of his thoughts. But these glades were not green. They were as dark as the cavernous depths that had always waited for him. Newton's old dictum, what goes up must come down. Could he pull himself out this time around? Not without a hollow metal fix. He needed it now more than ever before. His veins were hungry. The guilty pleasures were like an insufferable ringing in his ears, enough to drive anyone dog-mad, mad enough to tear out your eardrums, just for the silence to return and the cravings to cease. His sanity was screaming, just like Graham Wilson's mutilated hand. He found a liver bobbing around in Hoganfield Lock. Could have belonged to that fellow you heard, Russell muttered, scooping a spoonful of cold vegetables and losing the majority from the hand tremors. Didn't take livers for floaters, but I guess you learn something new every day. Jack's fleeting attention made him crack a contemptuous smile as he clutched one of the empty aluminum cans. The can fell by Jack's head, snapping him out of his pitch-black trance. Go meet yourself up, laddie. Russell laughed through strained, grinning teeth. Even if you went to the police, they'd have taken one good look at you and told you to scramble. Nobody believes rough slickers, let alone the junky ones. Come, quickly. Sonny Bean is painting the streets red. I'm sure that'll digest well. But Jack would not find his solace for another four nights. Until his next fix, behind the deserted good yards of the Great Eastern Hotel, the large piece of property that loomed over Duke Street had long fallen to ruin. A rough sleeper from 1900 times would have been able to call this place shelter, before storms and tenacious winds withered its structural integrity. Portions of the roof had collapsed, and its halls were vacant and uninhabitable. What remained of the hotel was a structure stripped down to its inner shell, more to preserve its character than anything else. This dose couldn't hold a candle to the last patch. No thanks to that fangled tooth dealer. It was so far deluded and inadequate that all he got was a mild spark of pleasure for roughly five seconds or so. What a fucking joke, Jack seethed. But at the very least, it was good enough to grant him some sleep for the night. The ringing momentarily fell still and was replaced by the sound of running water. It was coming from the Melendabar burn that emptied into a lower culvert in between two perpendicular walls. The burn's flow surfaced briefly for a few yards beneath Duke Street and then disappeared yet again into the underground channels of Green Glasgow's veins where it would eventually reach the Clyde. Across the gap on the west side was the car park of a business center surrounded by an eight-foot metal barrier. Sammy! The shout woke Jack. A woman with a black coat and faded teal trousers was scouring the goods yard. She looked to be in her late twenties with short, ruffled auburn hair. Judging by the high-pitched whistles and the, Here, boy! She was either looking for a dog or someone off their head. Come to think of it, yeah, maybe he'd seen a dog sniffing around the area before he shot up. A bark resonated from the burn. The woman scuttled toward the ledge and slapped both hands over her kneecaps. How'd you get down there? She sighed. An excited bark was the response. 
Jack watched her approach the caged ladder to the right that was attached to a rendered cement wall and topped with a safety railing. She carefully descended the steel rungs until she fell out of sight. After the quiet splash of her shoes, Jack crept forward and peered over the ridge. The Auburn girl was tailing a silk Labrador that splashed around her in happy trots. What was once bright yellow fur was now sopping and clotted with mud. No dog could look more content. What has got into you? She shouted with a partial laugh and hiss of annoyance while the cold water rolled over her heels. Need a hand, lass, Jack called down to her. Oh, we're fine. On your way, please, she said with a denoted sliver of passive aggression, not so much as batting an eye to him. Just as her fingers were about to hook the lab's green collar, she veered away and galloped downstream straight into the culvert. Sammy, no, no, she screamed, making chase and stopping at the foot of the tunnel where her voice echoed back to her. She paced the air passage back and forth like a wooden duck in a shooting range. Another bark reverberated off the brick-lined walls. And finally, after several attempts to coax the dog out, she sloshed her way inside. Little fucker, she jeered. Jack shuffled down the closest bank and cautiously dropped into the canal. Fresh, cold water straight from the northeast seeped into his shoes. He stood beneath the stone arch at the mouth of the passage, where the girl entered. It almost looked like a bullet shot straight through Duke Street's crotch. You find him? He called into the black corridor. Traces of her voice bounced back to him, still calling for Sammy. Once he stepped inside, it was almost as though a trip plate of events triggered all at once, an abrupt sequence that would leave Jack McKay waking in the middle of the night glazed with sweat and holding in the screams for the rest of his life. The calls for Sammy stopped and erupted into a blood-curdling shriek. The girl's silhouette flailed out of the darkness toward him, followed by a clop, clop, clop. A shadow reached out and collapsed on top of her. Something was there, a large, hunching, amorphous shape. Waves of acrid bacterial odors flooded Jack's senses. Without thinking, he pulled the lighter from his pocket and flicked a small flame to life. Through the dim light, he could see a bloated mass of wrinkled skin. Several limbs with hooves, twisted entirely backward, held up the bulk of its barrel-shaped body. Dripping hair that resembled pondweed stems encompassed its muscular neck with yellow patches of fur. Deep, heavy breaths wafted out of its elongated muzzle, anchored deeply into the girl's shoulder. Something snapped its brawny neck, a green nylon collar. Jack then realized the overall size of the being was growing, and the yellow blotches of fur were dissolving into its black mane. Why? A rickety voice squeaked out of her gray spectral face. Her words creaked out with a weight of sanity about to be pulled to pieces. Why aren't you helping me? The corner of her mouth perked up in a caricature of pure madness. The hooves began to scrape against the rutted floor, following downstream. She was being dragged away into the imperceptible bowels of the underworld. For a moment, the paralysis left him as he dived forward and gripped the woman's hand. The lighter plopped into the water and bathed them both in blackness. He pulled with whatever strength his welted arms could collect, but the black skin, or whatever it was, stuck to her like a viscid black tar. The sharp incisors in his shoulder clenched even tighter until a yielding blood vessel popped. Blood peppered Jack's face and made him lose grip. He fell backwards into the burn as it seeped into his lower regions. That was when he locked glances with the human-like irises, two slits of golden embers that held a cold light behind them. 
the sort of way a god would look at a fly, unmoved or unconcerned. Go ahead. Watch to your heart's content, my friend. Who will believe you anyway? Piss emptied from his bladder. In one fearful, convoluted swoop, Jack turned tail and fled out of the culvert's throat, deafening out as much of the woman's screams as he could. He ended up in a vacant lavatory of a nearby park, Footsteps of mud and dirt residue smudged the monolithic flooring, the petrified face of sagging skin and dark telltale eyes stared back at him. His skin had long lost its radiance, and after tonight, it would never return. Red pox streaked across his face, still wet and smeared. He cupped his trembling hands with water and smothered his face. Blood wreathed down the cracked porcelain sink and threaded down the drain. Did you see it? Yes, you did. Are you sure? Damn fucking sure. Twice now, the screaming had come. Twice now, people have disappeared. Those horrible eyes bored into his skull and left repeating thoughts of how gold can look so cruel. He could tell the authorities, but what would that do? They couldn't deny someone's disappearance, but as for the cause, he may well show up stark naked to the station to give the chief a big slobbery kiss. This must be what waist-deep in shite feels like, he thought. Russell was right. For the time being, he was the only one Jack could trust. He sneaked into the foreclosed corner house through a gaping window. On the upper floor, Russell was nestled over a stained mattress and lightly humming in his sleep. Jack shook him awake. What the fuck? He bellowed and swiped dazedly into the air. Russell, Jack's shiny outline spoke to him. Sonny Bean is painting the town red. Are you hocked up on the needle? Bolt your bag wag. Russell snorted and began to turn over. That was until he smelled the blood. Christ, what did you do? It isn't mine. Jack exhaled through the gaps between his pale fingers. Someone else's. The woman he took away. Russell's protruding nose wrinkled. What do you mean it? What are you on about now? Something was inside of the Melinda Bar Burn. That was as far as his tongue's deadlocked allow. Somewhere in the membrane of his thoughts was an aimless speck of wounded clarity. Never speak it. Never seen it, right? He wished it were right. Then he could run away from these things that would surely drive him insane. But no, it was too late for the gift of ignorance. I think it was a Kelpie. The words floated out of him. One eyebrow rose and crinkled Russell's forehead from his congested expression. Water horses aren't real. They're tails for bairns. I know what I saw, Jack exclaimed with the intensity of a stone pillar. And this Kelpie was not looking to offer children rides to their watery doom. It can change its shape. That's how it lured the young lassie That's how it lured Graham Wilson. It's real, Russell, and it feeds just like you and me. Your arse is out the window. How would all of Glasgow not be on its haunches if an actual Kelpie were swiping people from the street? The burn, Jack explained hastily. It's been moving beneath the city, all the nooks and crannies that run straight through Hoganfield Lock into the city. It finds someone alone, then takes them away. You said it yourself. This town has dark corners. Russell grunted begrudgingly. Say you are right, he derisively grumbled. And someone was hiding in the pipes. What could a junkie like you do? Images of that woman's petrified face were acutely sewed in Jack's mind, alongside the butchered hand, alongside the sardonic embers. Kill it, he breathed. 
I have to kill it before it happens again. Russell needed the bags beneath his eyes and drawled out a weighty groan. A portion of his sleep-deprived brain wanted to slap every piece of nonsensical gibberish out of this dafty fool. The rest could not deny the blood as much as it wanted to. Jack McKay was a forlorn and hopeless heroine head, but it was no murderer. The look in his dread-stricken face reanimated a distant memory for Russell, back into the depravity known as Belgrove Hotel. About three years ago, I fell on desperate times and took to the Belgrove Hotel. You've never seen squalor like that hellhole. Rats infested the courtyard, and our five by ten-foot rooms with barred windows. The stairs and the moldy corridors reeked of urine and vomit, and emptied cider and vodka bottles were left in the corners. Residents would smoke joints and drink themselves unconscious, while the staff left them unattended in pools of their filth. The owners were banking around a million or so a year in housing benefits. One night, a wee old laddie burst through the door, looking white as the tail of a ptarmigan. She was crying for help, saying something pulled her daughter into the sewer drain. One of the staff, some African man, he threw her out into the street. We barely had any room for ourselves. To this day, I, I wish I had helped her. But my spirits were too hobbled. A few days after that, a pair of lungs turned up in Hoganfield Lock. Russell stood up from the bed and crunched his neck to the side. They could both hear distant thunder outside. He walked over to the pile of bags with a graceless gait. I thought she was off her head. Frankly, I still think you are. Jack watched him fumble through one of the swollen black bags until he pulled out a small box. He returned to the bed and rested the black box over his lap. The devil be damned if they fish your parts out of that lock. He unclipped the metal holders of the box and opened its contents to Jack. The shakes have made my hand pooched nowadays, so I don't have much use for it. The Glock 17 pistol lay there in its container with a box of Winchester silver tips shoved next to the grip and trigger. But if you're talking out your fanny flaps and stick up a bank, you forget my name. I? The biting gale rolled over the large kettle pond of Hoganfield Lock. It was one of the four large bodies of water in Glasgow Park, left behind by Ice Age giants. This was the paramount source of the Melendabar burn that led into the city. Thunder mumbled lowly from the overcast clouds hidden behind the night sky. Jack walked along the tarmac path that encircled the lock's outer edge, the pistol loaded and securely in his pocket. Doubt, consisting of where to look or what to expect, harassed the loony bravado he called confidence. It felt like finding a needle in a haystack full of ravenous snakes, and Italy wanted in the worst way possible about now. For all he knew, the Kelpie was lying merrily in the middle of this damn lake, enjoying the fruits of its labor. He glanced over the shallow stench of water and met a small wooded isle situated at its center. The isolated piece of land acted as a sanctuary that any buzzard or wildfowl could rest in followed the trail to the southern corner of the lock, closest to the wooded island Sandy Beach. Unfortunately, the only way to reach it was to trek through the watery gap between the shores. He stared at the water's glittering ripples from the wind, hypnotized by its alluring seams. Perhaps if he swam like a madman, it would be over in a minute or so. But even sixty seconds could separate the dead from the living. He'd be nothing less of an oblivious swan waiting to be pulled under, 
ripe for the picking. But if his theory was right, and he had every reason to doubt himself, the Kelpie came here to finish feeding. Frankly, he wasn't even sure if it needed to eat for necessity. Those tapered gold eyes weren't hungry. They were egotistic. After all, gods only eat and drink for pleasure purposes. Finally, the madman made up his mind and traversed into the cold with a pistol held over his head. It was shallow enough for his feet to slop through the clumps of sand and submerged both shoulders. A sudden shock ripped through him as a long, slender reed ran up his pant leg and filled him with frightful visions of a glistening black mane. He propelled himself against the Langmuir currents, expecting at any moment for a set of powerful jaws to rend the flesh from his ankle and drag him into the bubbly black abyss. The sand slanted upwards as he reached the wooded island and pulled himself ashore. Fingertips smoothed in soft, sticky earth never felt greater. A streak of lightning flared across the sky and released a thunderous crack that would have given Tyrannus and his six-spoked wheels a run for their money. Jack retreated into the dense layers of shrubs and thick undergrowth. Mature oak trees loomed overhead, housing many nests. Other than the birds, plants were the dominant species here. He somewhat hoped, anyway. The farther he traveled through the foliage, the lack of human disturbance became evident. There was no chisel path nor signs to follow. If any soul went missing here, they'd disappear into the soil forever. He scraped the thought for now. The greenery soon opened into a clearing, probably somewhere in the island's center. Thunder rumbled a low-pitched growl above him. But there was a different sound behind it, the sound of sobbing. Someone was close. Ugly roots of fear and relief of another human presence branched through his system. He couldn't allow himself to stop now, not after everything he'd witnessed. Even if he survived this night, the uncertainty would inevitably kill him. The whales led him to a sloped woman curled up vulnerable against one of the lofty oaks. She whimpered as her auburn-colored hair hung between her knees. Miss, Jack spoke softly in between her convulsive gasps. The pasty, sickly-looking girl floundered against the bark. No, please! She shrieked with an anguished blue eyes. A patina of cuts and bruises covered her body. Most notably, the torn fabric over her left shoulder revealed grooves of missing flesh. It was the Auburn girl. Jack couldn't believe she had survived. It's okay, he said, and slowly drew closer to her. I'm here to save you, lass. You, you're the one that left me to die, she screamed hoarsely. Aye, you're right, but here I am, he traced the forested area with a cursory glance. Where's it gone, he inquired. She shook her head and started to bellow. I, I don't know. Everything was dark and wet. Something wouldn't let go of me. It dragged me deeper and deeper. Where's my dog? Where's Sammy? I can't say, but right now you need a hospital. The Auburn girl pointlessly attempted to upraise herself with trembling noodle legs. I can't. It hurts too much. My ankle feels twisted. She whined pitifully. Couldn't be helped. Jack knelt beside the girl and hoisted her arm over his shoulder. Her petite body leaned into his. In this position, he felt as vulnerable as she was. Did it already know he was here? Was it baiting him for a two-for-one deal? Despite the possibilities, the woman needed medical attention. He'd have to make that wager. They traversed through the hedges toward the border, where Jack came in. The thought of crossing that water now felt like suicide. But what choice did they have? None. A quiet voice of reason whispered. 
What's your name? He asked through the wet strands of short hair, copper head. Talking, yes, talking would help. She didn't answer. Quite a nice heap of shite we've ended up in, eh? Jack said with a makeshift chuckle, holding whatever sanity existed in an upside-down world. She still didn't answer. Despite his constructed machismo woven from self-assurance and resolve, something wasn't right. The woman had a dainty, lightweight look to her, but she felt heavy, almost like a gravitational pull only affecting one of them. The weight of her steps thumped the ground. Her arm, resting on his shoulder, seized around his neck. A scar of lightning fire ripped through the sky and illuminated the entire lock for an instant. He looked at her, and she looked right back. Blue eyes no longer greeted him, only golden embers. Something wet and clammy clung to Jack's arm. Her pastel skin took on a runny, gelatinous texture, like a doll in a microwave. He climbed over his shirt and suctioned to him. The fabric of her clothes lost the texture, and now resembled vaguely colored gelatin, the viscous goo-like secretion that once made up her body, crawled over his arms, his torso, and started up the neck. Her eyes were infatuated with him, and harbored an almost coy assertion, I win, they said. Two booming flashes illuminated them, one from the storm, the other from the pistol stowed away in Jack's pocket. The fly trap substance released him while the silhouette shape of the girl collapsed to its knees. The rough outline of her dissolving figure was sputtering heavily from the newly opened hole where her throat and the silver bullet were acquainted. Her color blackened to a pitch residue. That pungent fungal smell was back and stronger than ever. Muscles in its back contracted and then bulked together like an interweaving tumor. But Jack wasn't done yet. Two more shots opened the creature's expanding back. It gurgled out a droning moan. Spouts of white which reminded him of star jelly shed it out of its wounds. An eerie satisfaction suffused through him. So gods bleed, do they? How does it feel? He yelled through a fixed rictus grin. By now, its mouth and nostrils had elongated into a flat muzzle with projecting razor-edged canines. Beneath her was the muffled pomp of several ribs being pulled out of place and curved outward. She was getting larger, more cylindrical. The bones in her arms and legs were forcefully extending. Her toes and fingers shriveled away into slanted cone-shaped stubs. Another round tore straight through its fleshy jowl, and then two more in its hind leg joints. The creature squealed piercingly like a banshee. It reared its triangular head backward, where Jack caught sight of its eyes filled with crystallized fear. The universe coursed through his veins once again and transcended his mind to an unsurpassable threshold. He had met the enemy, and by the saints, this day was his. Send me another, he screamed to the tempest sky. Send me another ignorant god to put down. The large thonic horse raised itself upward, still bleeding the star jelly profusely. Its powerfully built muscles leaped into a four-beat gait. Clumps of earth kicked up in Jack's face from its twisted hooves. He gave chase to the monstrosity with his pistol, deadlocked on its fleeing figure. Where are you off to? I thought you enjoyed the hunt. Jack cackled as he madly fired off more shrapnel in its direction. The beast ripped through the thicket and leapt into the lock with an explosive splash. Jack skidded to a halt just an inch from the edge and bombarded the disturbed water until the click-click 
click of an empty magazine. Come back any time, you big Jesse. I'll be waiting right here, you fucker. He screamed, unhinged and hysterical. He sloped backward and fell flat on his back. A sensation of raw, unfettered joy bathed his frantic bliss. And for the first in a very long time, the jitters ceased. Russell Gresham was lying between a doorway with a sheet of cardboard pinned behind his spine and another tucked beneath his sleeping bag. It was a humid sundown with a few late rain outbreaks that left the pavement cold and wet. His panhandling cup grossed four pounds, big tippers today. The deplorable foreclosed house he had temporarily called his own was remarkably put back on auction and sold. But rough sleeping was nothing to a soul like his. Slow-paced footsteps approached. Russell didn't look at him. It may put off potential alms. Come on, let's hear that charity. His inner voice implored the stranger, anticipating the lovely clink. By hell have I lost it? The stranger abruptly spoke. Russell lifted his eyes to the astonished face of Jack McKay, or someone that resembled him, anyway. But that unchastened face couldn't belong to the Jack he knew. It was too bright, too much life in the cheeks. The clothes were also too clean. He was sporting a gray fleece jacket, dark green trousers, and unblemished sketchers. Well, if it isn't my favorite near do well. Russell chuckled, glancing at him up and down. Got all the muck and gunk out of your system. His animated cheeks creased to a broad smile. Most of it. He laughed and bent toward Russell. A few still linger here and there, but I've reduced it. And how did you go about that? Drug crisis took me in. They got me on methadone to stop the cravings. It was hell's bells, worst night of my life, but eventually the urges lessened, and I was able to quit the needle. The next thing I know, I found a warehouse job. So that is what ate you up, Russell said. I thought for sure it was your imaginary kelpie. Has it bitten your arse yet? Jack's tongue lapped around his lips. An empty, searching expression impeded his glowing smile in a thousand-yard stare. Not since then, he muttered. Russell still remembered that night, six months ago, when Jack returned, swamp drenched to high hell in a white plastered face like a nun who kissed St. Andrew himself. That deep-seated look wasn't crazy, more so enthralled. I got rid of it. He muttered from the floor, with the empty pistol lying over his knees. Sent the bastard back to the watery hell. It crawled out of. That was the last Russell saw of him. He figured that maybe Jack's monster had caught up with him. But there was one other thing. No further organs were found drifting in Hoganfield Lock since then. And it wasn't imaginary, he added during Russell's recollection. Perhaps I am crazy, but let's say I was to believe what I saw. Because whether I do or don't, that won't change the fact that two people died, kicking and screaming in the dark by something that was, and still might be, lurking in that lock. Russell shrugged passively and shot an incredulous look. Goes to show... Tighten the hinges and there will still be a few screws loose. Speaking of which, you still owe me for those silvers you wasted. I owe you a lot, Russell, more than you may tolerate. Jack said as he rose to his feet and extended his hand to him. Come with me. That solid stone tone was back. Russell blinked. What are you on about now? Get off the streets and come with me. Russell blinked again, and this time shook his head. No thanks, lad. I've seen all there is to shelters. Can't say I'm into 
Times are different. Jack interrupted him, his outstretched hand not wavering. Things aren't perfect, but they certainly aren't the same. Russell stared at him, at first flabbergasted, but then something else. To this day, he still isn't sure what prompted him to take Jack's hand, but if he were to wager a guess, it would probably be the look in his eyes. They were the kind of eyes that cherished their freedom, the sort of eyes that were able to defeat their monsters. Tonight's episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Keeps, the company dedicated to helping men stop worrying about hair loss and start taking action. No matter who you are or what age, losing hair stinks. I didn't realize how much I cared about mine until I noticed that some of my good friends started losing theirs, and it really got me thinking, could I be next? And what do I do if it happens to me too? Did you know that two out of every three men will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35? 35. For many, that's a shock. And they're not prepared. They just don't think it could happen to them. That was certainly the case for one of my co-workers. Turns out they weren't wearing hats to keep the sun off. They were embarrassed after discovering their thinning hair. But then something amazing happened. He signed up for keeps. After starting treatments, he didn't just stop hair loss in its tracks. He actually grew some of it back. I couldn't believe it. Before they started the treatment, they dreaded taking showers and the sight of their hair collecting in the drain filter. He even stopped letting their wife run her fingers through his hair. All because every time she did it, he'd worry she'd end up with a palm full of hair in her hands. But he decided he'd had enough and signed up for keeps. And I can tell you the difference was obvious. I noticed the change in his attitude before he even said anything. And that was before I'd ever heard of Keeps. It was obvious he was doing something different. I just didn't know what it was at the time. To me, it's clear that thanks to Keeps, my friends don't have to worry about hair loss. And you and I don't either. Now, the best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. Keeps treatments can take up to four to six months or more to see results, so it's important to act fast. Keeps makes getting started easy, so there's no excuse to lose any more hair. Sign up takes less than five minutes. Just answer a few questions, snap some photos of your hair, and you're on your way to looking great and feeling confident. They offer affordable access to generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. You may have tried them before, but probably never for this price. And not only is the price right, Keeps understands hair loss is a sensitive subject, and the last thing they want is for you to be embarrassed. See, you used to have to go to a doctor's office for your hair loss prescription. And that can be humiliating, and it seems a lot of guys I know would rather lose their hair than admit they have a problem. But thanks to Keeps, you can visit the doctor online, get hair loss medication delivered right to your home. They make it easy and deliver your medication every three months so you can say goodbye to pharmacy checkout lines and awkward doctor visits. Don't delay. Find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors and why nearly 100,000 men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention medication. Keeps treatment starts at just $10 per month, plus for a limited time. As a listener of this show, you get your first month free. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to Keeps.com told to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash told, spelled T-O-L-D. Be sure to use that URL to let the kind folks at Keeps know that Otis Jiry and Scary Stories Told in the Dark sent you. Thanks so much for listening and for considering Keeps this month. 
Your support means a lot to both of us. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the Molindinar Burn by author Michael Page, as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got a second terrifying tale for you. This one from author Ryan Peacock. In it, a father sets out to exact revenge on the person responsible for taking the life of a loved one. But there's a problem. His daughter's killer isn't human. Without further ado, I present to you Eastgate. Nobody believes in vampires. They're just myths, old folk tales that have been bastardized by cinema, pulp horror, and cheap romance, done to death until they're nothing but a cliché. Only children are afraid of them, which is a far cry from the fear they once caused. A fear so great that villages of men who would be considered reasonable would defile a grave and mutilate its inhabitant. I'm not going to pretend as if I don't understand it. I would have scoffed at the notion, too. I never once saw myself hunting them, and even then I would have imagined something far more dramatic. A special kit full of stakes, silver bullets, and other tools to kill the undead. Not a beat-up Chevy, a photograph of a woman, and countless restless nights in a motel. The part of my brain that was still somewhat sane was amused by the mundane reality of vampire hunting. But, sane or not, every day I would drive in search of the dead. Her name was Harriet Hartman. She was an unassuming woman in her middle age. Brown hair tied back into a bun, Coke bottle glasses, and laugh lines around her smile. She looked more like a librarian than a vampire. I think that was why she was such an effective killer. Over the weeks I'd spend tracking her, I determined a pattern. She fed roughly once a week, and she liked couples. She'd approach the woman in a public space and spend a few days with them, befriending them. Then she'd take them away, usually to a motel, and soon after the man would follow. Both would then disappear, and Harriet would deposit the keys to her room and vanish before daybreak. Most of the time it was a boyfriend and girlfriend, but sometimes it was a father and a daughter, two co-workers, a sister and a brother, always a man and a woman, save for the occasions when she couldn't get her hands on the man. Then she'd only take the woman and vanish into the night just like she took my little girl, my Pauline, and she'd almost taken my son James. The disappearances weren't well documented, but when I started putting the pieces together, the picture became clear. On the rare occasions where they did find bodies, they were dismembered and drained of blood. But she stayed in the county. I would have thought there would have been more of an investigation but there wasn't. That's why I had to do it. That's why I was the only one who could. Through my weeks of study, I realized something. Harriet always traveled, and she seemed to hit just about every town, save for one, a little oceanside hamlet called Eastgate. There were no murders there, no sign of Harriet, but every town she hit was no less than five hours away, and the closer they were, the more frequent the attacks. So that was where I looked. If I was wrong and it wasn't her home, then I had nothing to lose. But if I was right, I could stop her once and for all. I could avenge my little girl. Eastgate wasn't easy to find. It was barely a blip on most maps. And when I got there, uh, I could see why. Too many houses were boarded up. The local McDonald's was only recognizable by the lighter space on the wall where the sign had once been. 
No customers inside. Nothing in the parking lot but weeds peeking through the cracks in the pavement. I was surprised, honestly. A town like that should have been lively and booming in the late spring. It had a perfect location right by the shore. When I parked my car at the motel and stepped out, I could hear the distant cries of gulls and the lazy crash of the ocean. But instead, this place was dead. Stepping into the motel office, I was greeted by a sleepy-looking woman watching a movie on an old TV. Judging by the lines in her face, she was somewhere between 17 and 71. It was hard to tell for sure. Good afternoon. I booked a room for Terry McKinnon. The woman paused her movie and didn't bother confirming my reservation. The motel was empty. She grabbed the nearest key to her. We charge up front, she said, plus a $50 retainer fee. Keeps the rooms looking nice. I paid without complaint. If Harriet was here, it was more than worth it. As she printed out the receipt, I took out the photograph I had of her, a picture taken at a bar by a friend of some of her victims. In it, you could clearly see a stoic-faced couple, and behind them, Harriet. She watched them from the bar through her Coke bottle glasses. At a glance, it would be easy to ignore her, but I was convinced she was staring at them, sizing them up. By any chance, would you happen to have seen this woman around before? Would you? The woman behind the counter paused and leaned in toward the picture. I can't remember, she replied. I don't think I have. And I didn't get the impression that she was lying. The motel room was cleaner than I had anticipated. I expected a dingy mess, but the beds were soft. The carpets were vacuumed. The room smelled nice. Care had obviously been put into maintaining this place. I took some time to get situated. I checked the news for anything that might indicate Harriet had struck again. They found some unidentified body parts a few towns over, but from the sound of it, those weren't fresh. I knew those parts would be forgotten quickly. That murder would never be solved. Someone else had just lost a child, and the world didn't care. C'est la vie. When I had started my investigation, I initially pegged Harriet as some sort of serial killer. She fit the bill all right. It wasn't until I managed to catch up to her a little over a week ago that I learned any different. We were staying in the same hotel, and I saw her leaving as I checked in. I watched her closely right up until she let another innocent girl into that room, just like she'd done with my Pauline. I was going to try and catch her in the act. I convinced myself I was going to save that girl, so I took some extreme measures. I had already bought a gun, and I kept it in my pocket as I threw a chair through the window of her room, and then barged in like a madman. I found her with her teeth in that girl's neck, Harriet tossed her aside and rose to confront me. Blood ran down the neck of her victim, but there was none on her lips. As she stood, I could see her fangs in the moonlight, and in my shock, I fired at her. The bullets hit her in the chest, but she barely even flinched. Fangs bared, she fell upon me, seizing me by the throat. Her eyes studied me in the instant before she smiled. It appears I have a stalker, she said calmly. Desperate for help, I looked over at the girl she'd brought in with her. She sat on the bed, a hand pressed to the wound in her neck. But she didn't run for help. She just stared at us, at me. Just an observer to our drama as it played out before her. You look familiar. Have we met? Harriet asked took my fucking daughter. My language made her recoil more than any of my bullets had. Oh, did I know? Was it Pauline by any chance? She was a good girl. 
I almost hit her for saying her name, but my fear of her stayed my hand. You're a good father, looking to avenge her like that. She was a very lucky girl. Just like that, Harriet tossed me aside like I was nothing. Just for that, I'll let you leave this time. Go home. Following me isn't going to get you anywhere. I should have listened to her. She took the girl and walked over me. She was in her car and gone long before anyone came to investigate the noise, and by then I was gone too. I took a walk on the beach to clear my head. The stink of the ocean didn't bother me. On the contrary, it helped me clear my mind and set up a plan of attack. If Harriet was here, someone had to have seen her. I brought up a map of the town on my phone and picked out all the locations that might help me. Hubs for the community, bars, restaurants, the local grocery store, all the perfect places to look. There wasn't much in Eastgate, so I couldn't imagine it would take me long to get through everything. My little walk helped me get a lay of the land. Eastgate had a small main drag leading down to the empty beach. On the south side of town was a seawall with a dock and marina. There were a few houses out that way, but nothing much. To the north, the houses were a bit nicer. It wasn't quite a suburb, but it almost passed as one. The stores there were all local businesses. Eastgate was too small to support anything larger, like a Walmart or Target. The few deviations were a small school and a halfway house beside a bus station. Strangely enough, I never saw a single bus pass by while I was in Eastgate. I had lunch at a little diner by the marina, fish that was overbattered and chips that were mushy and bland. I flashed the picture to the owner, who frowned and shook his head. Can't say as I've seen her around, he admitted. At least I don't think I have. I thanked him and paid my bill as he disappeared out back, reaching into his pocket for his cell phone as I did. I got the impression that my patronage had been more of a bother to him than a boon. With my stomach uncomfortably full of grease, I started to walk back to the main drag, planned out my next move. Maybe I'd try the grocery store next, or, or a bar. I'd take the time to cover a few more places that day, and then try the rest the next. If I got nothing by then, it would be time for a new plan. Heading towards downtown, I passed my motel and paused as I saw a familiar red Lamborghini Aventador parked out front right beside my car. I stopped and stared at it for a few moments, and as I did, I saw a man get out. At 29, James was a reflection of everything I could have been. Handsome, successful, smart, a great athlete. I was proud of him, no matter what. I'd left our company in his hands a few months back, and he'd grown into the role quickly. That Lambo even suited him better than it ever suited me. James strode toward me, tall and confident, looking around at the empty scenery around us. "'What are you doing here, Dad?' his voice asked, stern, as if he were the father and I were the child. "'Enjoying my retirement,' I replied. "'I didn't buy that for a second. "'You're wasting your time out here. "'You're not going to find Pauline.' "'No, but who knows? "'Maybe I'll run into something else.' James' brow creased. How many times do I have to tell you to leave it to the police? Should I? I asked. Because they've done a really stellar job so far, haven't they? I'm taking you home. The statement was curt and demanding, leaving no room for negotiation. Clearly, he didn't know who he was talking to. The hell you are! I brushed past him, heading toward town again. Ever persistent, that boy of mine followed me. You can't just keep chasing her, Dad. 
What if you end up dead? Then I'm sure it'll be a lovely funeral. I replied, I need a drink. Are you coming or not? James sighed in disapproval, but kept stride with me. Look, if you're mad at me, I get it. She called me to that motel room, and I blew her off. But you told me yourself she was probably already dead, whether or not she made that call. I know, I replied. I don't blame you, James. I blame the bitch that took her. Just because we didn't find the body doesn't mean I know. I said it more sharply than I had intended, and James stopped in his tracks, unsure of how to respond to me. Just, just give me a few days to look around, all right? That's all I ask, I said to him. Can you do that for me? He nodded slowly. Yeah, okay, Dad. But afterwards, you come home. Stop chasing the killer, because if you don't, Sooner or later, you're going to run into her, and you're going to get hurt. Now, it was my turn to nod, but I didn't say anything. I kept walking toward the bar, leaving James behind. The town bar was called Shelby's Place. Dim red lights and country music gave the place a homey feel. The bartender was a muscular bald man with a heavy beard. I ordered a gin and tonic before showing him the picture. In the low light, he took a few moments to look before he shook his head. As he did, the doors to the bar opened, and a woman walked in. She was young and dark-skinned. Her eyes held a knowing look to them. There was something about the way she moved, methodical and seductive, like the ocean itself. She sat a few seats away from me, and the bartender was on her immediately. Of the usual, Gary. Wordlessly, he fixed her a drink, and after a moment's thought, I changed seats to sit beside her. Put it on my tab, I said. Her eyebrows rose, but she didn't protest. Well, thanks, stranger. To what do I owe the pleasure? Her tone was flirtatious. I thought you might answer a question for me, that's all. I replied. Her smile widened. Well, then, the answer is, yes. I am single. I caught myself blushing just a little bit. I'm sorry. Uh, that that wasn't exactly it. I'm looking for someone, actually. I took out the picture again. You can see anyone you recognize. She looked down at the picture and followed my finger to Harriet's face. Nothing could hide the recognition in her eyes, but she didn't answer immediately. I've seen her around, she finally said, and looked back up at me. What's your business? I wanted to ask her some questions, I replied. That's all. It was a lie, but I didn't much care for that. The woman propped her head up with her hand. Oh, that's all, huh? She asked. Well, I'll give you a pass since you're obviously new here. You're one of the boys out by the motel, right? I caught you having an argument with that fella with the fancy red car a little while ago. Yeah, that's my son, James. I admitted. We're just looking into the disappearance of my daughter. I was told that that woman might know something. So you're not the cops, then? The woman asked. I'm just a concerned father. The woman nodded thoughtfully as the bartender brought her. Her drink, a rum and coke, she took a sip. I can check and see if she's around. Harriet goes out of town on business every few days. Do you know what kind of business? I asked. House calls, the woman replied. I'm sorry, I don't think I caught your name. Right, sorry. I'm Terry McKinnon. Well, nice to meet you, Terry. You can call me Clarice. Anyhow, maybe if she's in town... I can introduce you later. After all, you seem nice enough, and Harriet's a sweetheart. She wouldn't hurt a fly. I highly doubted that. I'd appreciate it, I said. Just let me know when. Stick around your motel. I'll come knocking. Clarice replied and raised her glass to me. Thanks for the drink, Terry. James' car was still out front of the motel when I got back. 
The sun was starting to go down and bathed the otherwise empty parking lot in a golden glow. Walking past the Lambo, I found myself thinking about how small it looked. How had I ever enjoyed driving that thing? Saying it beside the used sedan I bought a while back, I realized that I actually preferred the sedan. Staring into the empty driver's seat of that cramped, angular car, I caught myself resenting it a little bit. All my life, it had been my dream car. Each and every success had brought me closer and closer to it. I'd made so many sacrifices just for that dream of success. My ex-wife, Megan, had called me a workaholic. I told her I was only doing it to provide for my family. But that was a lie. I did it for me. I did it for the money. And those sacrifices always seemed so small. I missed a few weekends, and I didn't see my family often. When I was home, I was tired and irritable. Pauline had taken the divorce especially hard. She and James had lived with her mother for the first few years. The only reason they ever came back to me was because Megan had passed away. I trusted James to raise her right. He was the older child, and thus the more responsible one. I had my work to worry about. Always my work. Now, all these years later, here I was staring at my beloved Lambo and hating it. I called James to join me for dinner that night, but he didn't answer his phone. I could only imagine he was avoiding me. So I ordered takeout from the one pizza place in town and waited for Clarice. She came for me around eight that evening, knocking on my door. Good evening, Terry, she said softly. Sorry to keep you waiting. She walked in without an invitation. I stopped by the halfway house and asked about Harriet. They told me she was going to get back in tonight. And I know she's a bit of a night owl, so... I thought it might not hurt to swing by and talk to her. Are you sure she'll be okay with that? I asked. Yeah, they, they gave me her number and I checked in with her. She said she'll be up for a while if you want to swing by. I studied Clarice for a few moments. It had occurred to me that she was working with Harriet, but it seemed almost too paranoid. I don't see why not then, I replied. Clarice tipped me a winning smile before leaning against my door. All righty, then. I'm guessing you've never been to the halfway house before, have you? I can show you the way. Give me a minute. I need to freshen up a bit first. I lied and shooed her out of the room. I didn't need long. I changed my shirt and put on some deodorant, but that wasn't why I chased her off. I pocketed the gun and hid a wooden stake I'd fashioned a while back in my belt. If I had a shot, I wasn't going to waste it. Clarice was waiting patiently when I stepped out of the room to join her. We made small talk as we walked down the beach, toward the halfway house. The house in question didn't look that much different than any of the other suburban houses by the beach. It was large but well-maintained, with a wraparound porch that looked homey. As we drew closer, I could see a figure sitting in a chair on the porch. I could see the slight burn of a cigarette. Harriet sat patiently, waiting for me, like we had all the time in the world. Hey, Miss H., Clarice said playfully as we drew nearer. Harriet exhaled smoke and smiled. Good to see you again, Clarice. Is that the man you mentioned? Yep, this is Terry. Harriet's eyes rested on me knowingly. Well, thank you for bringing him along. Head on inside. Patricia had a birthday last night. There's some cake left over. Help yourself. Terry, would you like to have a seat? She offered me a spot beside her as Clarice proudly stepped into the house again. I stood in the sand for a while watching the bookish vampire as she smoked her cigarette. No sound except for the gulls and the waves. After a few tense moments, she spoke. I can't imagine what you think of me, Terry. She sighed. 
I assume you have some means to kill me on hand, correct? Correct, I replied. The slightest smile crossed her lips. Well, I should have seen this coming. You're the first person to follow me home. It was bound to happen eventually. You can't just go around murdering innocent people, I replied. Did you think no one would notice? It would have been naive of me to say yes. I hoped what I paid the local law enforcement might keep anyone from digging too deep. But you're made of sterner stuff, it seems. She chuckled. From what Pauline told me, you were the last person I expected to see showing up at my door. But I suppose I shouldn't be surprised. After our encounter at the motel, when I heard someone had showed up in town asking about me, I had my suspicions. I hope you didn't mind that I sent Clarice to collect you. But dragging this out wouldn't have benefited either of us. I took the stake from my coat and Harriet's eyes focused on it. But she didn't move. She inhaled on her cigarette. If you're going to kill me, would you mind if I asked you a question first? She asked. I paused before nodding my head. I dreaded the moment when she'd pounce, when it was either her or me and I'd have to drive my stake through her heart. But she didn't move. How did I choose my victims? You chose couples, one man, one woman. I replied. She shook her head. No, no, no. Often, yes, it was a man and a woman. But what did every pair have in common? To that, I had no answer. Harriet sat patiently through my silence. I suppose by tracking me here, you've become a monster hunter, haven't you? She finally asked. It might interest you to know that I'm something of a monster hunter myself. People call for help all the time. So, I visit them, I assess the situation, and if need be, I deal with the problem. Abuse is like the tide. It waxes and wanes and drowns those caught in it. One sad truth about humanity is that people don't change, Terry. Some do. You did. But not all. Not the worst of them. Some people only destroy. They take. They hurt. They rape. I didn't choose to become what I am today. But they chose to commit their sins. What are you talking about, I ask? I'm talking about my victims. The bodies they found scattered along the roadways. Yes, that was me. But those weren't the monsters. Abusers. Rapists, no better than animals. And what about the woman, I ask? You expect me to believe that they're fine? Why take them, then? For safety, Harriet replied. If a body turns up, they're usually the first suspect. I've seen good people suffer for my crimes. That isn't what I want. So, instead, I take them with me. I help them heal, and when the time comes... Start again. And they let you feed on them, I asked. Some do. Some have nothing left. And they ask to become like me, like Pauline. My heart stopped in my chest. You're lying. Am I? Harriet tilted her head to the side and stood up from her seat. You can come out now. On her command, the door to the house opened. I stared in silent awe as she stepped out onto the porch. My little girl. My Pauline. Alive. Unharmed. She was there, right there in front of me. I dropped my stake, eyes fixated on her. My feet compelled me forward. I stumbled over my own two feet as I dumbly ran into her snatching her up into my arms and hugging her close. The tears streamed down my cheeks as I felt my Pauline's arms slowly wrap around me in turn. I thought I had lost you. I gasped. I thought you were dead. Sorry, Dad. I couldn't stay. 
Pauline said softly, her face pressed against my shoulder. I had to leave. I... I didn't think you'd care. Those words broke my heart. But I understand why she said them. Never in my life had I been a good father to her. It had been one disappointment after the next. I knew why she felt that way, and I hated myself for it. I'm sorry. I whispered, running my fingers through her hair. I'm so sorry. Harriet turned away, looking out over the crashing waves, and allowing us our privacy. Who heard her? I finally asked. Harriet looked back at me. Her smile was gone. Isn't it obvious? she said. It was. Harriet sighed, and as my hug broke with my daughter, I caught a look of shame on Pauline's face. I'm sorry, she said. I, I didn't think you'd believe me if I... I cupped her cheeks, silencing her. I'm the one that owes you an apology, I replied. I should have known. There had to have been signs. Tears streamed down her cheek as she bowed her head into me, and again I looked over to Harriet. Where's James? Inside, she replied. We weren't sure if it would be better to wait for you or to do it before. I didn't want this to end in violence. It won't, I assured her. I... I assume you're going to kill him. Yes. No lies, no tricks, straight to the point. The truth hurt. It was like a knife in my heart, but now I held my daughter trembling in my arms. I stood here because of what James had done, because of what I had allowed. All right. It was the only thing I had to say. I stood on the beach with Pauline at my side as Clarice and the two other dragged James out. I recognized one of the girls as the one I'd seen Harriet feeding on. Dad! James' voice was cracked with fear. What the, what the hell's going on? His eyes settled on Pauline and widened. Huh? How? I know what you did. I replied calmly. The look on James' face confirmed it. No, no, whatever she told you, it's a lie. I didn't touch her. I would never. She's my sister. I swear to God, I'd never. He struggled and fought against the women. Harriet watched quietly from the balcony, and Pauline left my side to approach him. Dad, Dad, come on. You gotta believe me. God damn it, Dad. I just stood there and stared as Pauline loomed over him. One of the other girls jerked James' head back. He cried and struggled. He fought. He begged. But he did not escape her teeth. Last night I parked a Lambo on the edge of the harbor. I put it in neutral, and I pushed it into the harbor. James' suicide letter is in his room. What he did was unforgivable, but through my neglect I enabled it. And so I share the blame. Tomorrow, I will leave Eastgate alone, and perhaps somewhere in the distance, I may find my absolution. I hope you enjoyed Eastgate by author Ryan Peacock, as performed by yours truly. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page, or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts, and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today 
and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep. If you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jivey Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? (laughs) Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.